You're listening to the Life and Times of Video Games, a documentary podcast about video games and the video game industry, as they were in the past and how they came to be the way they are today. My name's Richard Moss, and this is episode 14, Load Runner, the first in a new season. I'll talk a bit more about what that means at the end of the episode. Doug Smith was a student and part-time computer center consultant at the University of Washington in 1982 when he came upon a game development project for the VAX-11 mini-computer called Kong. It was primarily the work of James Bratsanos, who'd created an earlier version of it for the Commodore PET the previous year at high school. A prototype, if you will, that he called Suicide. Now James didn't often play games. He liked to code, to devise the methods by which magic could happen on a screen. He hadn't even played the game that inspired Kong, or Suicide, which isn't much of a surprise given how different these prototypes were to that game. You see, Suicide took its cue from an excited but kind of vague description a friend had given James of the Donkey Kong arcade game. As such, it was reminiscent of something you might have heard about Donkey Kong 4th or 5th hand, like from a friend who had heard about it from a friend of theirs who had watched somebody else play for 10 minutes, which is to say recognisable only to the barest of degrees, comparable only if you squint at it for a few seconds and then walk away. In any case, Suicide starred an at symbol. Like in your email address or when you're mentioning someone, on social media, that the player would steer around in the levels, collecting stuff while evading a group of pursuing monsters. It had platforms and ladders, and your little at hero could dig holes immediately to its left or right, but not directly down, to temporarily change and reshape the environment. To plot an escape route, perhaps, or to temporarily trap those pursuing monsters? It would then take a few seconds to climb out of any holes they fell into. Or something a bit more audacious. Because this was the game's first touch of genius. Giving players the chance to also dig directly down would have been interesting. But it would have limited the possibility space. Because in a game with gravity, digging down beneath your feet means falling. It means easy escape in a tight spot. But digging down to either side of the character presupposes strategizing and planning. It forces the player to think their way out of a jam, and it allows the designer to craft many puzzles within each stage, to hide things beneath layers of platforms. Like, for instance, you could have a gold block tucked beneath a double-thick platform that's three blocks wide. In which case the player would then have to dig two adjacent holes, drop into the space they just created, and then before that space fills in and kills them, dig again to create a path to the gold. And this first bit of systemic brilliance was intentional, but the second was much less so. Each time the computer ticked through another processing cycle, the game would loop through all the objects in the level one after another, and adjust the paths taken by the monsters, who always tried to follow the shortest route to reach the player, and so would only move somewhere if it meant closing the distance between them. This was a simple choice from a programming standpoint, but it fundamentally affected the game's design. James's algorithmic approach imbued the monsters with an illusion of intelligence. Where other games of the era would set their enemies on predefined paths or move them according to behavioural patterns, also predefined, here they seemed to ponder, to scheme, about how to best catch their prey. Occasionally they might stop and stand still. Sometimes, like when the player dropped down a big distance, they'd radically change their path and snap off in a different direction, their movement filled with a new sense of purpose. This philosophy to the monster AI would stick with the game as it moved from prototype to prototype, system to system, on the way to its first commercial release. And we'll touch on this again later. But first, let's finish the story of how the game was made. 
At the University of Washington, suicide begat Kong. And with the help of Doug Smith and another programmer, Tracy Steinbeck, it grew more complex. They experimented with new ideas like projectiles and mines and shields, things like that. But still, it was an ASCII game. Platforms as solid block characters, bad guys as that symbol used to denote a paragraph break. If you've never seen it, it's like a backwards P with a double line on the vertical stroke. Most people thought that they looked like cobras, so the monsters became known as snakes. Nothing was animated as such. Rather, the characters, and literally characters, just kind of bounced around the screen, appearing and reappearing in different places as the play state refreshed. It was a popular game. Students at the university could boot it up by loading a program called Graph and entering a secret password into the function prompt. Because as at most universities at the time, and as it had been for the past 10 to 15 years of people making games on mainframes and minicomputers, the University of Washington frowned upon the use of its precious computing resources to play games. Games that invariably would suck up the majority of their daily processing cycles. Sometimes Doug's eight-year-old nephew would come in and help to play test Kong. One day, this nephew asked, why couldn't they put it on a floppy disk and play the game on an Apple II? Not an unreasonable question. And the, the, the fact is that that was basically impossible. The game was written in a language that the Apple II couldn't easily understand for a system that was completely unrelated to the Apple II and which had no floppy drive. But after some cajoling, Doug decided he'd rewrite Kong in 6502 assembly language on a borrowed Apple II. He called this version minor. The full details of what happened next are now lost to time, but there are some things we do know. The first of these is that Doug's friend Mark Ledbury, who owned that borrowed Apple II, later encouraged him to finish making the game. The second is that James Bratzanos didn't keep working on the game. His involvement ended here, partly because he didn't know 6502 assembly language, but also because Doug was so strong-headed that once he made the decision to carry on, there was nothing that would stop him. And so... In a sense, James was simply left behind by the sheer pace of Doug's work. Once he'd finished his new version, Doug submitted Miner to publisher Brudebund. They turned him down. The graphics were too simple, they said. And they had the wrong scale. The characters needed to be bigger in relation to the world. Doug wasn't about to give up, though. He borrowed $800 or maybe 1000 to buy a color monitor and a joystick, and then he set to work improving the controls and redoing the graphics and animation. Now Miner took on the familiar Roadrunner look, more or less. An all-white, faceless stick figure hero, the sprite copied from popular Apple II game Choplifter, but hand-animated by Doug himself, so that he could get the little details right with the way that little guy planted his foot on the ground when he wasn't moving. And the coloured shirt faceless bad guys that pursue him, which were basically the same sprite, just different colour. And then small rectangular blocks for gold, and the floors either in a brick pattern, if you can dig through them, or a solid block of colour, if you can't. He also had each level begin frozen in place. Nothing moving, no body moving, until the player acted for the first time. And this was another clever move. Because Miner was not a run-of-the-mill action platformer. And this change would ensure that it got received as the strategy puzzle it was meant to be. A game that's not about killing bad guys or getting from one end of a level to the other, but rather about plotting optimal routes to collect all the gold on the screen and then escape without ever being captured. Sort of a Pac-Man with gravity and shovels. 
Coming up on Christmas 1982, Doug resubmitted his game to Broderbund and to three other publishers. One of them offered him $100,000 as a flat fee for total rights to sell the game commercially, sans any royalties. Broderbund offered a $10,000 advance plus 23% royalties on gross sales, conditional on him making additional improvements to the game. He accepted Broderbund's offer. They would do the sound effects for him, but he needed to think up a new name, polish the animation, which at that moment looked more like ice skating than running, and deliver the 150 screens he'd promised in his pitch. Now at this point, Doug had mustered around 30 screens by himself. And he could not possibly come up with 120 more. He simply was not creative enough as a designer. So he got his nephew and the kids in the neighbourhood to come over and play around with the screen editor to dream up whatever crazy things that they could come up with. He promised to pay them for each screen that made it into the released game. And he also paid James Bratsanos $1,500 for his role in the development of the prototype versions. And meanwhile, Bruderbund paid one of their in-house programmers, Dane Bigham, to create a Commodore 64 conversion. By mid-1983, they were done. Miner made its final name change to Loadrunner in reference to a story they'd cooked up about your white stick figure being a galactic commander racing through 150 treasury rooms of the oppressive bungling empire to reclaim excessive fast food taxes in the name of the people, or something like that. Broderbund shipped the game a short time later for Apple II, Commodore 64, and Atari 8-bit computers. Then soon after that, also for various Japanese systems. Over the next several years, Lloyd Runner would find its way onto the Nintendo Entertainment System slash Famicom, around 20 home computer systems, and even an arcade machine, which made it the first commercial home computer release to be adapted for arcades, instead of the other way around, which happened all the time. It was an immediate success across all these versions, both critically and commercially. Bruderbund had told Doug at the beginning that they'd be happy to sell 10,000 copies of the game in its lifetime. They passed a million in 14 months, ended up with around 2 million on the Nintendo Famicom alone and 300,000 or so on the Apple II, many hundreds of thousands or millions more on other systems. In Japan especially, the game climbed quickly to the top of the pile. It was available on nearly every gaming and home computer system in the country within a year, and adored by millions. Bruderbund's own company newsletter touched on the phenomenon in the autumn of 1985, in a piece about a Lloyd Runner tournament involving 50 of Japan's best players, who competed on a giant Sony screen. I mean giant even by today's standards, 86 feet wide at the Tokyo Expo 85. A local TV station even asked Doug to test his medal against the kids in the tournament, two of whom were able to outscore him in a three-minute race to get as far as possible in the game. Western magazine reviewers were no less extolling of Lloyd Runner. Soft Talk magazine praised its crisp, charming look and the way it layered its challenges across the 150 increasingly diabolical screens. And also they praised another forward-thinking design decision. The option to give yourself extra lives or to jump to whatever level you like, whenever you like, provided you're not trying to get a new high score record. And I guess Soft Talk's readers agreed, because they went on to vote Lloyd Runner their most popular Apple program for two consecutive years. Electronic Games, meanwhile, described Lloyd Runner as the thinking gamer's climbing contest for its reliance not only on good dexterity, but also smart strategic analysis. InfoWorld senior editor Scott Mace had one of the smartest reads on Lloyd Runner's quality. He pointed out its subtle brilliance Unimpressive on first glance, but packed with clever touches, like those invisible trapdoors that your character suddenly falls through. Or the fact that enemies could well be carrying gold around with them. Gold that you need in order to finish the level. 
and you'd be none the wiser unless you happen to trap them in a pit. Roadrunner is a battle of the seen and unseen, he observed, later extending his plaudits to the startling number of variations it offers on its floor and ladders theme before you even get to the editor, which was no doubt a happy side effect of the small army of youthful level designers who contributed to the game's creation. For PC Magazine's reviewer, Roadrunner's editor was the best part of a great game. A mental challenge all its own that provided lay people with a special glimpse into the artistry of creating a computer arcade game. Everybody said nice things about that screen editor, which in a rare move for the time was bundled with every copy of the game, and which involved basically painting an empty playfield with platforms and ladders and guards and everything else in the Loadrunner toolbox. It was magnificent, this idea that you could make your own screens at the flicker of a few keys to extend the game as far as your imagination would allow. Brudeband recognised this and they took full advantage. They sponsored a Computer Gaming World contest for its readership to design new Loadrunner screens for a modest prize of $50 and a few other perks, plus a place on a CGW disc of 60 screens that would be sold separately. In the UK, Zap magazine made a deal for the best of their reader-submitted screens to make it onto Championship Loadrunner, a special 50-screen version of Loadrunner that Brudebund made out of the best player-created screens they received from all around the world. Additional Loadrunner games came thick and fast, as you'd expect for a hit game, although the original continued to be the main seller. Programmer Josh Scholar got to make the first attempt at a 3D spin-off with the isometric Loadrunner's Rescue, which mixed Loadrunner with popular Atari game Crystal Castles. Japan got most of the sequels, all minor, most of which didn't appear anywhere else. They were level sets essentially, with the occasional new feature or two, but they, they came out as standalone things across a whole bunch of different platforms. And Amiga fans, who never got their own official conversion, just went and made a few of their own. The rights reverted back to Doug in 1993, which is probably why a full, proper follow-up sequel came in 94, with The Legend Returns, which had Dane Bigham returning as level director and an art team on board to complete an elaborate redo of the graphics. No more little wide stick figure. The main guy had colours and clothes and everything. Plus they put a design team to work, adding several new elements like a jackhammer and a pickaxe and a few new block types. Then in 95, there was a not-so-great online multiplayer version, and a few years later, the series tried 3D again, both on personal computers and on the Nintendo 64, separate games. To modest success. The computer one was better than the console one. In 2005, Doug finally decided to sell off the rights entirely. He wanted to put it behind him after 22 years with the franchise. He once said that he'd worked only five years out of those 22. Time that he put into a mix of business deals for more Loadrunner games, uh, programming gigs, design roles on some of those Loadrunner sequels, and top-level production on both the English-language version of Secret of Mana, a Super Nintendo role-playing game, as well as Squaresoft's only American-made RPG, Secret of Evermore. The other 17 years, the ones he decided to take off, he apparently spent living it up with fast cars, fast boats, fancy houses, wives and travel, just enjoying the millions of dollars that he made from royalties. The Loadrunner publishing rights ended up in the hands of Spelunker HD publisher Tozai, which has been admirably controlled in its exploitation of nostalgia for that original game. I hope in recognition of the fine balancing act between appreciating and ruining an all-time classic. 
because that's what Lloyd Runner is, an all-time classic. It's one of the greatest games ever. A masterpiece in finely tuned imperfection. Just polished enough to look fluid and feel fantastic, but also just rough enough to have quirks that you can play with. The accidental humanity of the enemies, the fast and slow strategy of digging holes, the immense possibility space of the level editor, the demonstration of that possibility space by its 150 included levels, its elegant, exquisitely crafted systems made in the same recursive fashion in which they worked. Roadrunner was, and I think still is, the consummate arcade puzzler, a work of interactive art that showed us why the decline of the arcades wouldn't be all that bad. Because now you had games like this, and like Pinball Construction Set from EA. Games that make it clear that at home you could not just beat a game, not just master it, but you could explore it, break it, extend it, ponder over it, and reshape it into the game you wished it would be. The Life and Times of Video Games is created entirely by me. Music and writing and editing and all. If you're wondering what became of Doug Smith, he retreated from the games industry after he sold off the Load Runner rights in 2005. Then perhaps living the high life took its toll, or maybe it was just bad luck. But Doug barely made it past the game's 30th anniversary. He died in September 2014 aged 53. His story is not the only one I'll be exploring over the next few months. This is the first episode in a new season of The Life and Times of Games. We're going to have six episodes this time around, each released a couple of weeks or so after the previous one, and in a break from the old format, these six episodes are all going to draw solely on research and analysis. Last season there were, I think, two episodes that did that everything else was interview-driven. But the problem is, interview-driven episodes take forever to make. Like 40, 50 hours. And the show simply doesn't earn enough money to justify that effort right now. So I'm trying this style out for a bit. Something a bit less time-intensive, but I hope still really interesting. And then we'll take another look at the options after this run of six. In the meantime... If you like what I'm doing here, I'd appreciate your support. You can help by sharing your favorite episodes with friends and on social media, uh, by leaving a review in your preferred podcast app, or by making a donation. I accept one-off donations via paypal.me slash mossrc and monthly recurring donations on Patreon at lifeandtimes.games slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon backers Also get various perks like bonus interviews and sound bites, behind the scenes info, and the chance to vote on future episode ideas. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to everyone who has supported me so far, especially my producer level backers on Patreon, Wade Trigaskas, Vivek Mohan, Simon Moss, and Seth Robinson. And as always, you can find show notes and past episodes and everything else at the website, lifeandtimes.games. Also, I hope you like the new logo, designed by my lovely fiancé. Until next time, my name is Richard Moss, and this was Life and Times of Video Games. Thanks for listening. See ya.